Alam niya ang mute. Hello, me. We can start now. Please unmute your mic. Very good evening, everyone. We warmly welcome you to this legal discussion on marriage laws, a part of phase three of Law is Life, of the Pro Bono Committee of the Law Students Association, Sri Lanka. We are honored to have with us today as our speakers two well-experienced practicing lawyers in the field of family law. Mrs. Maizma Azar, an attorney at law and a visiting lecturer of the Sri Lanka Law College, who holds a great deal of experience in the academic sphere of Muslim law. We also have Mr. Nisal Kohana, an attorney at law, who has been practicing in civil jurisdiction as a junior counsel and also the chairman and the co-founder of Veritas Academy. Our speakers will be answering the questions collected by us from the general public on marriage laws. As we are streaming live on Facebook, you can, you can send us your question and they will be answered by our speakers at the end of this discussion. Akash? Yes, we can start. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Lisa, so our first question is, what, what is marriage under the uh, law of Sri Lanka? And what are the, um, what are the different laws that are pertaining to uh, marriage in Sri Lankan uh, jurisdiction? Yes. So first of all, starting, I think uh, we must first understand what is marriage. Okay, This is a, a common question posed to a lot of people as to, we know marriage is where you get married at a wedding, but we need to understand what is the legal terminology, what would amount to marriage. So we need to understand marriage is a contract which two parties enters into, specifically more likely to be a man and a wife, a man and a woman. So, which they would enter into a contract and they would be considered as husband and wife for a long period of time, basically till death. So, this contract can either ter be terminated later on due to unavoidable circumstances or whatnot. So, we need to understand marriage is merely a contract. Now, before we understood this uh, contract, there were laws, not, there weren't laws, there were norms and like general customs which were different from one to another. So then they decided to, basically this was an establishment of the Roman Dutch law. Our foundations on mar marriage, laws pertaining to marriage was a foundation, was created on the foundation of Roman Dutch law, and English law. However, this was, this became law in 1907 when the marriage registration ordinance came into effect. 
So they decided to they need to create a universal set of laws where any person or any individual with any ethnicities can enter into. This was the marriage registration ordinance number 19 of 1907. All right, and then this MRO basically established any any person to enter into a marriage. However, there were certain along with the MRO, uh, there were certain customary laws, especially like Kandyan law or Muslim law or Tesavalami, as said before. So there were customary laws too. So this was a whole of a jumble. That's why the beauty of MRO was to create a uniform system. So then we can understand either you can enter into a uh, marriage through one, either one of these customary laws if you fall within that ambit, or if not, you can enter into a marriage through the general MRO. So we need to understand the preamble or the main purpose of these acts in order to understand who can enter into which under which act. So that is the MRO. So then we have the customary laws where Candian law is governed under the Candian Marriage and Divorce Act number 44 of 1952. So this only applies to Candians who have been resided in the Candian province prior to 1850 or any descendants of such citizens. And then we have the Muslim law, which is governed under the Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act number 13 of 1951. Where again, this act only applies to Muslims who are inhabitants in Sri Lanka. And then we have the Tesa Valame, which applies to the Tamils who are inhabitant in the province of Jaffna. So we must understand the meaning of Tesa Valame. Tesa means country, Valame means custom. So together, this means a custom of a certain country. So basically, this Tesa Valame law governs the customs which are particular to the Jaffna province. And this law was established, or this law was brought to Sri Lanka by the Malabars from India. However, this does not only per se limit to any person who has been born or who is residing in the Jaffna province, but to any person who owns property also. This has been stated in section three of the Tesavalame ordinance number one of 1911. I think that should have given a pretty depth clarification as to what would amount to, what are the marriage laws in Sri Lanka. Um, yes. Would you be able to elaborate on uh, the types, different types of marriage in Sri Lanka? Let's say, for example, like um, customary marriage or registered marriage? Yes. So in, um, in order to understand registered marriage, so we need to go into the depth or the provisions of the general MRO. So it says uh, if you are in, there are particular limitations where you can enter into a marriage too. But we need to understand how this process happens. So in terms of the general MRO, or the mar uh, marriage registration ordinance, any party with other than citizens who follow the Muslim faith can enter into a marriage under this ordinance as stated in the preamble. This has been clearly defined in the preamble. So the steps as to the procedure has been given from section 23 to 36. However, the most of the provisions I'll be, touch I'll be touching it on it now. So section 23 says that both parties who are entering into a marriage must check whether they have resided in Sri Lanka for 10 days. One of the parties, then thereupon, one of the parties can give notice to the registrar, which they have dealt with. Then section 23, subsection 2, states that if not within the same division, if both parties are not within the same division, must give notice to the registrar saying that they are not within the same division and they have to inform the registrar. Section 23, subsection 3 says that if not, if one party is not residing in Sri Lanka, the other party must give notice to the registrar, the party who is residing in Sri Lanka. And section 23, subsection 4 says if neither party is a resident, so if both parties are not residents of Sri Lanka, they must give notice to the registrar and also justify that they have been residing in Sri Lanka for at least four days. So that is the uh, requirements that must be shown by the parties in order to enter into a marriage under the general ma marriage, uh, sorry, marriage registration ordinance. Then in section 24, it says that how notices should be given to the registrar. Notice should comprise with full name, race, age, and profession, all of that. 
Thereupon, the registrar will enter the details in the marriage notice book. And this notice, which is registered on section 25, is considered as publication of their marriage. This is considered as notice to the whole world. And then in terms of section 26, the, the registrar will issue the certificate. And from 30, uh, 27 to 36, they can amend the certificate as they want if there are any rectifications or amendments to it. Then let's go to customary laws. Normally, as I said, in Sri Lanka, there is the Kandian law, Muslim law, and the Pays of Alamias recognize customary laws. But apart from this, there are many customs which are not stated in the law. So these are those kind of marriages that we speak about today. The courts have recognized customary marriages contracted according to the customary rights and practices because it is not practicable to all the customs to be considered as law. It is not logical. If all the essentials of the customary marriage is in conformity, then uh, it is possible to contract as a valid marriage. So this, again, is a case-by-case -case basis. So we need to see whether the rituals and the rights have been, has been conformed to it perfectly. Then only the courts are going to construe it as a marriage. So this varies from area to area as well, because this is not only pertaining to the whole of Sri Lanka, because it differs from area to area, as there are numer numerous communities. This was affirmed in the case of Ratnamma versus Rasaya, where they said that, where the courts held that the validity of a customary marriage is a very much of a question of fact. So it's a factual issue rather than it's a law. It's a question pertaining to law. Yes. So this is another addition to the previous question. Uh, so does that mean uh, registering a marriage is a vital requirement in uh, under the current law of Sri Lanka? No. Registration of marriage is not mandatory. But in order, if there's a dispute between the parties, if they were meant to go before the courts, if they meant to appear before the courts, the courts are going to see, are going to ask for evidence of marriage. So in order to see this evidence of marriage, they must register this. So the registration of marriage in Sri Lanka is not mandatory, but an entry must be made at the made in the marriage register, and that is considered as the best evidence of marriage today. This was stated in the MRO of section under section 41. The courts do consider the information that was submitted in the register book as it is considered to be the best evidence that can be produced to courts in order to justify a marriage. This is the section 41 of the MRO. However, there are certain exemptions also where you do not have to register marriage, but the courts will construe it as a marriage. These are known as uh, cohabited, cohabited, uh, sorry. Yeah, these are known, known as cohabited marriages. So the law recognizes a rebuttable presumption of marriage by habit and repute, which I will deal with this in that link. Customary marriages, including various ethnicities and rites and rituals as uh, that they are follows, have been accepted as valid despite the fact they are unregistered. Yes. Um, can we uh, talk about the capacity to get married? Yes. So there are many limitations, not only the capacity, there is the age or the prohibited degrees of marriage. Example, let's talk about the age first. In terms of section 15 of the marriage registration ordinance, prior to 1995, because there was an amendment in that year, prior to that, they said that the male should be over the age of 16 and the female to be over the age of 12. However, by the Amendment Act number 18 of 1995, they said that both parties should be beyond the age of 18 in order to enter into a marriage. This was affirmed in the case of Tiagaraja versus Kurukkal in, in the year of 1923, 25 NLR 69. In this case, the girl was 11 years and one month when she entered into a marriage. The courts held the marriage was null and void. This was followed by another case called Gunaratnam versus Registrar General. So in going to the capacity of marriage, in going through the capacity, in terms of section 16, it talks about 
the prohibited decrees of marriage, where which part that uh, where marriage is prohibited in these instances, although if they have entered into. So where either party is a direct descendant from the other. That's the first part. Second is between a sister and a brother. Either it can be half blood or either it can be full blood. And the other part, the lastly, is between parents and their stepchildren. These three parties cannot enter into a mar marriage. Let's say in some instances, if they have already entered and later they figured that this is a prohibited marriage, in terms of Section 17 states the offence of it. In Section 17 of the MRO states any marriage or cohabitation between parties standing towards each other in any of the prohibited degree of relationships shall be deemed to be an offence and shall be uh, punishable with an imprisonment, simple or rigorous for any period not exceeding one year. So there is a punishment will be for one year of imprisonment. Along with it, there's another prohibition or a capacity in terms of it in terms of section 18 of the MRO. Section 18 says that no marriage is valid if the, the second marriage is not valid if the first marriage has not been dissolved or nullified in accordance to law. There was, there was an authoritative case called Hetiarachi versus Hetiarachi and others, 2004, 3 SLR 116. So second marriages are not valid if the first marriage has not been uh, dissolved according, according to law. These are the capacity and the limitations where marriage where marriage lies at. Uh, what is cohabitation? Yes. So cohabitation is where two parties decides to live together, so, uh, live together, but to, but they are not they have not entered into a marriage at all. So the problem lies is, can we construe them as married? In terms of, we, I mean, the courts, can they construe them as marriage? So cohabitation is in two ways. It can be either by repute or by habit. So in terms, in order to define this, repute, uh, cohabitation by habit refers to the parties living together as husband and wife for a period of time. So through time, we understand these two parties have considered them to treat as husband and wife. Repute refers to the acceptance by the society as a married couple. So this is where we look, where the courts look into the evidence of the community, whether they have treated them as a married couple at the end of the day. So therefore, a man and a woman who have lived together as husband and wife, the law will presume until the contrary is proved that they, are, they were living together in consequence of marriage and not in a state of concubinage. So this is where it's merely a presumption, we can say that. It's a presumption until it's rebutted, they are considered to be married. So it must be noted that cohabitation by repute and habit is based on merely a presumption. And in the case of Fernando versus Darbarera, this was an instance where both parties cohabiting were dead and there was a need to see if such parties were married as there was no evidence of registration of their marriage. So there was issue. The only existence that existed was the evidence as to how they treated each other. Court held marriage by habit and repute could be recognized by law here. And in the case of Sederis versus Rosaline, a person of a higher caste, they started living together with someone of a lower caste. His friends and family treated him as an outcast and stopped associating him and stopped inviting him to social gatherings. The courts held the fact that they were negative, they were negative conduct by the relatives is good enough to justify that such parties fulfill this presumption. So the courts are willing to construe it as a marriage under such presumption. So, however, it must be noted that uh, customary laws in terms of presumption would vary. Example, the Candian law does not recognize any marriage if they are not registered. But however, the Candian KNDA or the Candian Marriage and Divorce Act have given the leverage where parties can either register through the MRO, which is the Marriage Registration Ordinance, or the Candian Marriage and Divorce Act. However, the Muslim law 
does not prohibit unregistered customary marriages and registration as well because it's not essential for a validity of a marriage under such law. The presumption may be drawn to prove a Muslim customary marriage. So it will vary from customary marriages as well when it comes to cohabitation. So let's uh, talk about customary marriage a little bit. Yeah. Yes. So in order to again identify what is a customary marriage, it's a marriage contracted according to traditional customs that is recognized by such the custom by the customs of that country. So as customary marriages, there are no specific legal provisions stated in the MRO, as they are mostly recognized by case law. So from case to case, as I said, it's a factual issue. Customary marriages must be looked at from fact to fact. Customary marriages can be conducted according to the rituals, usually followed by those by the same ethnicities or religion or area. Uh, customary marriages are governed by the customary laws that has been established in Sri Lanka as them being for, for Kandyan citizens, it's the Kandyan Marriage and Divorce Act. For Muslim citizens, it's the Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act. And for Tezavalam, it's the Tezavalam Code. Any other ethnicities, if they want to enter into a marriage in Sri Lanka, they have to do so if uh, they have to do so under the marriage registration ordinance, which is the general law. Yes. Uh, so we talked about uh, different laws, customary laws, uh, and special laws. Can you elaborate on these laws a little bit? Yes. So this, we can say that the Kandyan Marriage and Divorce Act is generally applicable to citizens who have been born in within the province of Kandy prior to 19, uh, sorry, prior to 1850, and to any of those descendants as well. These customary laws, if any parties do fall within the ambit of that scope, they can enter into marriage under that act. Uh, in terms of Tezavalame, uh, again, any citizen who has been born within the province of Jaffna can enter into these laws, can enter into a marriage under these laws. And also, any party who is residing within the northern province as well. So these are, they are not subject to enter into a marriage under them, but they are also allowed to enter into a marriage under the GRMRO, which is the General Marriage Registration Ordinance as well. Yes. Um, last question uh, is, uh, can a person choose which law they want to be married under? Yes, of course. Uh, basically, a citizen is allowed to any party is allowed to enter into a marriage under any law. So if, uh, if the customary law also allows that privilege or the leverage of entering into a marriage under any other laws, they can do so. Example would be the Kandyan Marriage and Divorce Act. In terms of uh, Section 3 of the Kandyan Marriage or Section 4 of the Kandyan Marriage and Divorce Act, it says that uh, the reg the registration can either happen by the marriage under the marriage registration ordinance or either the Kandyan Marriage and Divorce Act. In up upon that, uh, the marriage can be considered as valid. Thank you. Uh, we are moving on to Kandyan marriage now. Uh, can we uh, talk a little bit more about uh, the Kandyan marriage law? And is there a necessity for the both parties to be Kandyans in order to be married under Kandyan law? Yes, there is a necessity where both parties must be Kandyans in order to be married because the, the preamble or the purpose of this act was where, uh, where it governs Kandyans to be married or either divorce under this act because the laws in this act has been stated in such a way where it is applicable within the Kandyan province too. So as we know, the KMDA or the Kandyan Marriage and Divorce Act applies to Kandyan marriages and divorce as stated in the preamble as we know. KMDA allows the Kandyan who was a resident of the Kandyan province as at 1950 to enter into a marriage under this law or any person who is a descendant from the said category. So therefore, there is a necessity where both parties must be Kandyans. 
However, again, as I said before, there is a leverage given to the Kandians to either to register under the MRO or either the KMDA as well. Okay, so can, uh, I think we talked about this uh, previously, but let's clarify this for the for our audience. Is registration essential under uh, Kandian law? Yes, registration is essential in terms of section three, subsection one, uh, sub A, it states that marriage between a person subject to Kandian law shall be solemnized and registered under this act or under the MRO. And in terms of section three, subsection one, sub B, states that any such marriage which is not solemnized and registered shall be invalid. So that means any party who is entering into a marriage under the KMDA must register their marriage. If not, they are considered as not married at all. Yes. Thank you. So uh, our next question is, do we still have the practice of one woman uh, marrying more than one man under candy and law, which is called um, gay Kava? Yes. No, we do not have, uh, we do not recognize that because this would amount to a criminal offense called bigamy. So the Kandian law does not recognize polygamy and polyandry at all. This will amount to bigamy just as an ordinary law will amount to a criminal offense. Yes. Um, so this is a, again, we talked about this, but let's clarify for our audience again. Um, can a Kandian opt out of the Kandian marriage law and uh, be married under the net general law? Yes, we can opt out from yes, and Kandian can opt out from the care the Kandian Marriage and Divorce Act because Section Three it allows the party to either can be registered under the Kandian Marriage and Divorce Act or either the Marriage Registration Ordinance. So, if they register under the Marriage Registration Ordinance, they'll be governed by those provisions. So, any party can opt out from that. Yes. Thank you, sir. So I invite Farah to continue the discussion. Thank you, Anjali. Uh, my next question is, sir, uh, is the marriage law applicable to people who are subjected to the Tesavaname law in Sri Lanka? Can you hear me? Hello. Is that? Sir, you're muted. Hello. Hello. Sir, what is the marriage possible to people to a law? The question, I think I'm not receiving the question properly on your end. Uh, it's breaking. Para, it's okay. I'll continue then for the moment. So the yeah. question is on Tesavala Melo. So mm -hmm. the question is, what is uh, the marriage law applied to people who are governed under Tesavala Melo? So the law which will apply to marriages under Tesavala Melo is the Code Act Number 11 of 1911. Number 1 of 1911. That is the code which will govern the marriages under the face of law. Thank you. Um, so let's talk about uh, now we know that uh, Tesavalame, how we can get married under Tesavalame law, and what happens when a person gets married 
uh, the effects of a marriage and the Tesavala Melo. So, the, after getting married under the Tesavala Melo, there are different acts which will apply for the citizens who have been, who have entered into a marriage under this. Example, when it comes to inheritance or when it comes to property law rights, it will vary from one to another. So, because the property rights in the Northern Province is governed separately from the laws which we understand today in the general norms. So, when it comes to property law, when it comes to inheritance, when it comes to the marriage rights, it varies from one to another. So, therefore, on the case of Alame, it, there are separate acts. Some of these acts would be Jaffna Matrimonial Rights Inheritance Ordinance, number one of 1911, the Tesa Valame Code, Act number, Code number 18 of 1806, and the Jaffna Matrimonial Rights Inheritance Amendment Ordinance, Act 58 of 1947. Thank you. So that's all we have for uh, general law, Candian law, and Tesavala uh, law. I think Farah will be continuing the questions for uh, Muslim law. Farah. Thank you. Thank you, Anjali. Uh, now we move on to the Muslim law questions. Mrs. Maiza. Uh, my first question is, uh, what is, uh, when does a Muslim law apply to an individual? Madam, you're muted. Okay. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay. Before discussing as to uh, uh, when, sh uh, when does Muslim law apply to an individual, we should know who a Muslim is. Uh, a Muslim is a person who follows the uh, religion of Islam, uh, a monostatic religion. So, uh, Section 2 of the MMDA uh, states, MMDA means the Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act, states that this act shall apply uh, only to the marriages and divorces and other matters connected therewith of those inhabitants of Ceylon who are Muslims. So a Muslim could either be a born Muslim or those converted to Islam. Neither the Holy Quran nor the Muslim law applicable in Sri Lanka makes distinction or introduce any categorization when it comes to Muslim by birth or conversion. Uh, I think I'm not receiving the question. You're not audible, Farah. Um, we can't hear you. Can you please repeat again? Farah, we can't hear you. You're not audible. Uh, yeah, now? Uh, yes, yes, better. Yes. Yes, sorry. Sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, my next question is, uh, what is the statute applicable when it comes to marriage under Muslim law? Uh, the statute law as regards to Muslim marriages in Sri Lanka is embodied uh, in the Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act, number 13 of 1951. And it has been amended time to time. Thank you, madam. Uh, does the MMDA reflect the marriage laws given by the Prophet in Islam? Uh, to a certain extent, yes. Uh, under Sharia law, uh, for a marriage to be regarded as, as valid, there are five requirements. Five requirements should be satisfied. The parties should have either the capacity to marry or the capacity to be married. The second is the parties should agree to the marriage. That means ijab and kabul, the offer and the acceptance should be there. Uh, then the third one is the formalities of marriage should have been followed. And the fourth one is there should be no, no legal impediments to the marriage. Uh, there should be uh, no fosterage, no affinity, uh, 
the bride should not be uh, observing it the those are the impediments uh, to a valid marriage marriage so there should be no legal impediments to the marriage and the fifth one is the dower mahar should have been provided now it is expressly provided in section 16 of uh, the uh, muslim marriage and divorce act that the validity of a muslim marriage does not depend on registration or non registration and should be determined according to the muslim law governing the sect to which the parties to such marriage belong the muslim law governing the sect to which the parties to such marriage belong now before looking at this matter in great greater detail uh, it is necessary to first understand the uh, classification of sects and madhabs in muslim law now as we know the two great sects of islam are the sunni and the shia sect and the former consists of four schools of thought that means uh, madhabs namely shafi hanafi maliki and hanbali in uh, afifuddin versus periyatambi the sri lankan courts have decided that the majority of sri lankans belong to the shafi sect uh, school of thought of the uh, sunni sect uh, but we should not forget that there are sri lankans who belong to the hanafi sect uh, school of thought as well so especially the maimon community in sri lanka uh, belong to the hanafi sect now uh, again if we uh, pay our attention to section 16 of the muslim marriage and registration act uh, marriage does not depend the validity of a marriage does not depend on, on registration or non registration and should be determined according to the muslim law governing in the sect to which the parties of such marriage belong now if the uh, parties belong to the shafi sect then the validity of the marriage should be decided uh, based on the shafi law and if the uh, parties are uh, parties belong to the hanafi sect then the validity of the marriage will be decided based on the hanafi law now the conclusion that one could arrive at by looking at section 16 is that a marriage valid under muslim law would be recognized as valid even if it is not registered on the other hand a marriage that has been duly registered and which has not followed the requirements of the muslim law to which the parties belong then such marriage shall be considered as invalid so it is clear that subject to the other provisions of mmda the validity of a marriage and its consequences fall to be determined by principles of original islamic law that means the sharia but there are provisions in the mmda Uh, which are repugnant repugnant with the muslim law the original muslim law the sharia law for an example the exercise of the right of polygamy and the talaq procedure now it is imperative to incorporate into the act the conditions insisted upon by the sharia for the exercise of polygamy the provisions contained in the muslim marriage and divorce act regarding the divorce has also uh, to be carefully considered in the context of the increasing incidence of talaq which have which has become a serious social problem in the absence of specific provisions in the act thank you madam that was very clear um my next question is according to the mmda there's no minimum age of marriage but islam insists upon uh, the age of puberty but the mmda allows with permission of the quasi for a per, uh, for a girl to get married under the age of 12 is this the reflection of the accurate law that ha- that has to be governed uh, that governs a muslim marriage the question of age of marriage marriage has now become a hot topic in the uh, mmda debate now it is noteworthy that the muslim marriage and divorce act does not lay lay down a minimum age of age for marriage the only provision for of mmda that deals with the age of marriage is section 23 of the act uh, which prohibits the registration of any marriage contracted by a muslim girl uh, who has not attained the age of 12 years unless the quasi for the area in which the girl reside has after uh, an inquiry as he may deem necessary authorize the registration of the marriage now the sharia law does not does not prescribe a minimum age of marriage that is true but it may come as a surprise to many of us to hear that the concept of age of marriage is not unknown to the sharia 
and fiqh. Fiqh means the Islamic jurisprudence. And in fact, there is ex explicit reference uh, to age of marriage or puberty and age of discretion in the Holy Quran. When speaking of age of marriage, the Holy Quran speaks of two concepts, that is bulug and nikah, age of marriage or puberty, and roshad, age of discretion in the Holy uh, age of discretion. Puberty signifies physical capacity and refers to the period at which a person's sexual desires are aroused. Now, this period, this is a, this is more or less a relative concept. This period differs from males and females, as well as from region to region and even person to person. Islamic jurists hold that physical capacity by itself is not enough for a person to handle the responsibilities of a marriage and hence sound judgment, that means uh, uh, age of discretion, is equally important. So the marriageable age is determined under Muslim law based on attaining bulu, that means the uh, age of marriage or puberty, and rushat, that means the age of discretion, or in other words, puberty and age of discretion or sound judgment. Nevertheless, there is an uh, urgent need to establish a minimum age of marriage for the Muslims of Sri Lanka uh, due to uh, issues of uh, abuse that have taken place in the recent past. These issues have also cross border dimensions. There have been reported incidents where Malaysian men crossing over to neighboring Muslim provinces of Thailand to marry child brides. Therefore, there is an urgent need to establish a minimum age of marriage for the Muslims in Sri Lanka. Thank you, Madam. Uh, the next question we have is regarding the most uh, the famous case of uh, Abe Sundara versus Abe Sundara. Can we have a simple elaboration on that case in regards to the Muslim marriage uh, which governs uh, Sri Lanka, the laws? Yes. Now, uh, in Sri Lanka, as in several developing countries, there is a mosaic of personal and general laws. Many non-Muslims became converts to Islam with a view to enter into a subsequent, subsequent marriage, which was uh, possible under the Muslim law, but disallowed under the general law. In most cases, the conversions had been to contract a second marriage when there was a subsisting marriage under the general law. The first important case uh, challenging this practice was the case of AG versus RE, in which the Privy Council held that in a country with several systems of personal laws, there must be an uh, an inherent right in the inhabitants to change their religion and to contract a polygamous marriage notwithstanding an earlier marriage. However, the Supreme Court in Abe Sundara versus Abe Sundara overall the case of A.G. versus Sri. What happened in this case was one Christopher Abe Sundara was married to Natalia Abe Sundara under the general marriage ordinance or the marriage registration ordinance. After almost two decades, Christopher developed a relationship with one Khan Deidre Singha and instituted divorce action against his wife, which was dismissed by the district court. Christopher and Kanti then converted to Islam and got married under the Muslim law. Christopher's first wife, the wife uh, under the general marriage ordinance, uh, filed a case against Christopher and he was charged for bigamy and was convicted. In appeal, the uh, provincial high court set aside the conviction. Then the first wife made an appeal to the Supreme Court. The matter was first heard before a, a, three bench, a, a bench of three judges and then referred to a bench of five judges as the matter was of importance. And the Supreme Court held that the GMO recognizes only monogamous marriages and Abe Sundara, I mean Christopher Abe Sundara, 
being married under its provision, acquired a status conferring statutory obligations and liabilities that are pertaining to the GMO. Therefore, by a unilateral conversion to Islam, he cannot absolve himself of the statutory obligations of the first contract of marriage. The Supreme Court also held that the prohibition of uh, polygamy was in, as enshrined in the GMO rests on grounds of public policy. So the law stands as today is, if a person has contracted a, a marriage under the general law, cannot make unilateral conversions without dissolving such marriage and contract a, a second marriage under the Muslim law. Thank you, madam. Uh, 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 in an earlier question, you briefly mentioned the capacity of uh, a, a, a Muslim entering into a marriage under the Muslim law. Can we have a bit more insight on what are the capacities to enter into a marriage uh, under the Muslim law? Yes. Now, as I uh, explained, there are five re requisites to contract a valid marriage under the Muslim law. Now, the first essential of a valid, valid marriage under Muslim law is that the parties should have the capacity to contract a marriage. Or if they have not this capacity, they should be contracted in marriage by their marriage, marriage guardians, or we call, in Arabic, we call, uh, refer it as wali. Now, who is a wali? Wali is a person who has a right to dispose of the hand of a woman as he please. It could either be the father or father's father. Or person who have the right to assist a woman as guardian at her marriage. The agnet members from the father's side, where there is no female intervention, such as the father, father's father, brothers of the father, brothers of the paternal grandfather, those are considered as uh, valid guardians or valis. Section 25 of the uh, Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act, according to Section 25 of the Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act, no contract of marriage of a woman belong to, belonging to the Shafi sect is valid under the law applicable to that sect. Now we have a rough idea as to uh, who, uh, what the Shafi and Hanafi means. No contract of marriage of a woman belonging to the Shafi sect is valid under the law applicable to that, that sect unless a person entitled to act a, as her wali is present at the time and place at which the contract is entered into and co communicates her consent to the contract and his own approval thereof. Which in other words means that in a Muslim marriage, the bride is not present at the time of the uh, marriage contract is entered, instead her wali either the father or the uh, paternal grandfather or any agnate uh, family member from the father's side would be communicating her consent on behalf of her and also uh, communicating his approval thereof. Now section 47 subsection, uh, subsection 2 of section 47 deals with instances where well, the wali unreasonably refuses or withholds his consent to the marriage of a woman. And subsection 3 of section 47 deals with instance where the woman has no wali. Two instances where the wali has unreasonable, unreasonably refused uh, or withholds his consent to the marriage of a woman. The second instance is where the woman has no wali. Then in both situations, the quasi on application may inquire into it and then authorize the marriage dispensing with the necessity for the presence or consent of a body. Thank you madam. Thank you madam. Uh, so there's this problem of dowry and mahar uh, in Muslim marriage. So my question is, is dowry a legal requirement for a Muslim marriage to be valid? Or is it just the mahar? Now, according to Muslim law, dowry is referred as mahar. 
the concept we know as dowry under the general law is unknown to the Muslim law. Okay? According to the Sharia law, dowry or mahar is referred as a, as a payment made by the bridegroom to the bride at the time of the marriage. And yes, mahar or the dower paid by the bridegroom to the bride is a, a legal requirement under Muslim law. Unless the dower is paid, the marriage would be uh, invalid. Now, under Sharia law, the dowry, as I told you, uh, it is a requisite to contract a valid marriage. The difference between the general law and the Muslim law, uh, as I told you, the, the, um, when it comes to dowry, is in Muslim law, dowry is paid by the bride, groom to the bride at the time of the marriage and is enjoined by Muslim law as a token of, a, of respect for the woman. Now, the parties could fix the quantum of the mahar by mutual agreement. And also, the bride might expressly agree or waive her right to the dowry. Now, if she, if she does not require a dowry, then she can waive her right to the dowry. The dowry, the mahar, is a, is a right of the woman or a right of the bride. However, where the obligation to provide the mahar is not exp expressly uh, excluded by the agreement, then the parties and the parties have not agreed on the amount of their dowry, then the woman would become entitled to a proper dowry, proper dowry to be computed considering her age, her beauty, fortune, understanding, virtue and her social position and nowadays uh, necessarily the her education level and this mahar may be either prompt or deferred the prompt dowry is payable immediately on the marriage taking place and it must be paid on demand and the registrar when the dowry is paid the registrar must record it in the marriage certificate how much is paid and whether the dowry is paid at the time of contract in the uh, marriage uh, it has been said that where the uh, mahar is prompt, where, where the mahar is not, uh, if the mahar is uh, deferred, a woman can refuse to uh, enter into conjugal relationship until she receives the dowry. Thank you, madam. Uh, my next question is, uh, can a person who is subjected under, who, under the general law marry under the Muslim law again? Now, I think uh, the answer for this question I gave when discussing Abhay Sundara versus Abhay Sundara, a person who has contracted a marriage under general law cannot contract uh, a, a second marriage under the Muslim law by making a unilateral conversion without uh, obtaining or, uh, a divorce uh, from the district court of law uh, from his uh, previous marriage. Now, if a person has contracted the um, uh, pre, uh, first contracted the first marriage under the JMO, he has to obtain a valid divorce, and then he can make a conversion to Muslim law, and then contract a second marriage, unless and until such marriage is dissolved uh, according to law, he cannot contract a second marriage under the Muslim law. Thank you, madam. Uh, the next question is. Uh, if the consent of the bride has been obtained by force under uh, the Muslim law or the Muslim marriage in a situation like that, will that marriage be valid under Muslim law? Uh, yes, the marriage will be valid because the wali has communicated the consent on behalf of the bride. Now, as I told you, wali's uh, consent at the time of the marriage is regarded as the bride's consent so marriage will be valid under muslim law because the wali has provided the necessary con necessary consent and he has communicated the bride's consent but the bride has the right to repudiate, repudiate the contract of marriage on a later date stating that it has been contracted contracted against her wish uh, providing necessary evidence Thank you, madam. 
uh, nowadays we have this uh, conversation about a Muslim man um, being allowed to marry uh, many uh, up to four times. And uh, so can we have uh, an insight upon how many times he is allowed to marry and uh, uh, what is the law under Muslim, Muslim law, how, how it is um, conducted? Now, uh, a male Muslim may marry any number of wives, not exceeding four at one time. But a female, only one husband at one time. She can contract a second marriage if she has obtained a valid divorce from her husband or in the event of the death of, of her husband and after uh, observing the Iddha ritual. Now, these pro prohibitions are based on the uh, teachings of the Holy Quran where in uh, chapter uh, 4, uh, uh, verse 3 of ch chapter 4, the Holy Quran says, Marry women of your choice, two or three or four. But if you fear that you shall not be able to deal justly with them, then only one. So the right of a male Muslim to marry a plurality of wives is expressly permitted. But what is important is the admonishment that is if one, that means if, if, if the male Muslim is not be able to deal justly, then he should stick to one. What must be remembered is that a Muslim male is not enjoined to a polygamous marriage. Four wives is a limit, a ceiling, but not a right. It is in the form of an exception. Now, as Professor C. G. Viramantri in his book Islamic Jurisprudence correctly says, the ultimate intent of the Prophet, according to this, uh, his view, was to transform marriage from a polygamous to a a monogamous relationship. The ultimate objective of Quranic marriage law then was to legitimate monogamy rather than to endorse polygamy. Thank you, Madam. Uh, our general uh, Q&A session regarding Muslim marriage uh, ends now and we have a question from the general public from uh, the Facebook live we had uh, ha we're having. Uh, the question is, Madam, uh, if the marriage is constituted in Sri Lanka and the family has moved to the Middle East and they want to apply for a divorce, should they come back to Sri Lanka and do it? Or how is the process uh, regarding yes. a situation like that? Yes, if they have contracted the marriage in Sri Lanka and if they are not present in the country, they, they either they have to come back to Sri Lanka to institute divorce and it depends on who wants to uh, institute a divorce action. Now, when it comes to divorce under Muslim law, there are three, four types of divorces. Uh, the first type of divorce is Tala, which is available to a man and the second is uh, Fasahu. Uh, the divorce available to a female or the uh, wife. Now, if if uh, if, if the uh, male needs to uh, institute divorce action, then he can do it in the uh, quasi court. By way, he can institute action by way of a power of attorney. But then again, uh, the parties has to be present in the uh, quasi court at the time of the inquiry. Therefore, in order to obtain a valid divorce under Muslim law, they have to be present uh, in the uh, quasi court. But if they wish to obtain a mutual uh, a divorce, that means a consent divorce, which is called as a Mubarak divorce, then they can do so uh, by way of uh, giving power of att attorneys and uh, uh, giving uh, consent affidavits. Uh, and the quasi may not require them to be present for an inquiry. Thank you, Madam. Uh, my next question is, uh, can anyone apply two laws at the same time? Two laws at the same time. What do you mean? Two laws at the same time. Uh, now, if, the per if a person has contracted uh, a marriage under Muslim law, the divorce has to be obtained under Muslim law. He cannot seek the uh, protection of general law if he has contract if he or she has contracted a marriage under the Muslim law. Thank you, madam. Uh, that was uh, a great, we have uh, 
we have come to the end of a fruitful Q and A session. Uh, now I invite uh, my good friend Shalomi Dasan uh, to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Farah. Uh, we would like to thank our speakers, Mrs. Maiza Azar and Mr. Nisal Kohana for enlightening the general public by covering in their explanation the many crucial matters pertaining to the marriage laws and simplifying uh, these uh, complicated practical issues by their detailed explanation. We would like to also thank the members of our association who took part in organizing this online discussion and who gave the technical assistance in streaming this online discussion. Finally, we would like to thank the online participants who actively got involved with this discussion by sending their comments and questions. We hope that this discussion is informative and helpful in clarifying your doubts and questions and stimulates exchange of views among the general public on marriage laws of Sri Lanka. Thank you.